Hi, welcome to Country Stitchers. I'm Liz. We're continuing our discussion on basics in this video. There is one in our playlists and in our all videos list uh, if you're looking for it and haven't seen it. And this one is its sequel. We're going to have a general discussion about basics. Um, after that video aired, we had people ask about certain topics, many of which we've discussed over the years in other videos, but incidentally, not in a combined way of all basics discussion, perhaps. So as I go through some of the topics today, I'll inform you and show you, uh, I've written them down, which video you might go visit to look at more about that topic. I don't want to make this inordinately long, so I'm going to shortcut some of the discussion that way and let you go see some of those other uh, sections. But I want to start with a question about where do you find patterns? People talk about all kinds of different places. Um, patterns are often found on leaflets, which are just a small folded, it can be eight and a half by 11, it can be half that size, it can be on a small card. Prairie Schooler does a Santa card every year, it has one small pattern on it. But this is considered a leaflet. It's a, a folding heavy stock, and it's got, this particular one has one, two, three, four, four different I was looking to see if there was an extra one in there. Four different patterns, each of these are included. And this came out in the, in the 80s. Another popular leaflet manufacturer was Leisure Arts. That was very mainstream when I started. Um, and they produce everything from a one page pattern to a multi page leaflet. And this is one of their booklets. This was called The Big Book of Cross Stitch. A um, hundred Looney Tune designs. This is a lot of fun. My husband enjoys Looney Tunes. In fact, when he was young, he had one of their long playing albums, their ongoing soliloquies, if you will, between the characters memorized completely. And he used to recite it in the car. From what I hear, it drove his parents nuts because he would make all the voices and the sounds. But anyway, I've stitched a lot of things out of there for him. Then there are magazines that come out. Most of them are coming out quarterly now. There were some that were coming out every other month. Then some of them stopped producing and publishing at all. Now Stony Creek has a magazine. There's a couple of English magazines you can get from overseas. And then um, there's a newer version of a cross stitch and needlework, needle arts, I really want to say, um, magazine called Punch Needle and Primitive Stitcher. And this is a really nice magazine. This is the one I subscribe to now. They're about 120 pages in this one. This was their mega Christmas edition. And it does, it has everything from cross stitch to punch needle and a variety of designers and a variety of pattern types to choose from. And then perhaps the most commonly spoken of is a PDF file. There are a lot of patterns now being developed, um, especially by designers who want to be able to share their patterns. And there's a lot of cost involved in shipping and people are trying to avoid that. Um, so if it's developed in a PDF, it's a computerized electronic digital version and you download it after you purchase it. This was a free PDF. This was what the first basics video used as a resource for its stitching demonstration. And this is by Brooks Books and it's a Katie Kitty and it's the K out of the A through Z ornaments that she produced. And if you want to see more of them, just go to her website, Brooks Books. And it's brooksbooks.com. So this has been out since 2014. And there's still 
available on her website. She has a section on her menu, I think it's called freebies, and that's where you'll find it. So those are PDF files. They stay in your electronic file until you delete them. You can print them like I did. You can stitch from your electronic file. So there's no shortage of opportunities and places that you can find things to stitch, including your craft stores, your local needle workshops, um, no limit. Now let's look at the next important thing, which is your fabric. And there are two major discussions on fabric in our past videos. Perhaps the most comprehensive was video 33. And then we talk a little bit more about even weave in video 46. And the most commonly talked about fabric for a new stitcher or a stitcher that started back in the day is Ada. And it's four threads woven over four other threads. And they form a square where they overlap one another. And then the holes to either side of that become the place that you put your needle through. Let's see if you can. I don't know if those squares show up very clearly, but that is Ada. And this is actually vintage country mocha. So it's um, a modeled version of Ada. And a linen version of that same color is here. And linen and even weave are really synonymous. And I'll explain the difference. But that is linen. This is 32 count linen. And you'll notice that not every thread that you're looking at in that picture is the same thickness as the threads around it, whether it's vertical or horizontal. This is also vintage country mocha and 32 count. So that's actually what distinguishes Lugana, Joblin, other types of even weaves from linen even weaves. Now there are uneven linens as well. And when you stitch on those, your thread count is not the same horizontally and vertically. That's the definition of even weave, that you have as many threads present in an inch horizontally as you do an inch vertically. If it's uneven, you will have fewer threads in one of those dimensions than in the other. So that's why you can have even weave linen, and then you can have Lugana, which is even weave and not linen. And in that case, those threads are all the same size. And I'm going to show you a white piece. And you'll notice that all those threads bear the same depth and height. So they're synth synthetic. The other ones are woven through the process that you do when you create cotton or linen. Um, and then you have that discrepancy in the, in the thread. It gives a different look to the finish, and I'm sure you've noticed if you've looked at much needlework, when people tell you what they stitched it on, you'll start to see there's a difference in the final uh, product, but some things just look really great on linen, and some things look even better on even weave Lugana, Jovelin, whichever your choice is. Then you have what I would call a specialty fabric, Perforated paper. This perforated paper is by Mill Hill, as are most of them. And you can see the, the coloring in this. This is a modeled look to the perforated paper. In fact, all three of those, with the exception of the Lugana I showed you, all look like country mocha. So that's a really pretty modeled piece of um, perforated paper. This goes way back into the 1800s um, stitching on paper. 
even perforated paper. And it's a, it's a fascinating topic. We did do a Did You Know series on perforated paper. You might enjoy looking back, seeing if you can take a look at that. And then there's other fabrics that are designed for particular things. This happens to be Ann cloth and it's a an afghan and you can see where there's a texture to it and then there's an inset and this is 18 count in here and it's an even weave and you can stitch in these blocks so it's very large i'm not going to hold it open but that's another type of fabric i have fireside which has small insets in it deb's done a couple of things on fireside that you've seen um the, the two that come to mind, she, she did the autumn bell pull that's done on fireside fabric. She also did, um, or is working on her winter. Don't think she's finished that yet. But anyway, another example of using a different type of fabric. Let's look at needles for a moment. We had quite a discussion on needles in video 28, and then we talked about needle threaders in video 81, 82. Needles come, they're the most common size that comes in a kit is a 24 tapestry needle. Tapestry needles have a, a rounded end on them. They're not considered a sharp a sharp is very pointy, much like a sewing needle that you would do mending with and will easily slide through fabric. The nice part about a blunt needle, a tapestry needle, is as you're locating the spot that you want to position your needle through, it doesn't just penetrate the fabric with that point. You can move it around gently and find the spot you want it in without it getting stuck. And I, I think we all appreciate that. This is a size 24 needle. It's a standard needle, comes in kits and packages. This one I'm gonna hold up next to it that's on the solid color felt. I can hold it so you can see the difference. Is a 26. It's a tiny bit shorter and the shaft is narrower smaller you get, I mean, the higher you get, the thinner the shaft or the smaller the needle. And finally, 28 would be your next size in the tapestry range. The 28s, I have also an example of a 28 petite, and I'm going to put the 26 next to it, and you'll see there's a significant difference in the length. Now, the 28 is going to be narrower than the 26. but the length is what changes with a petite needle. And I stitch using a sewing method and I enjoy the petites for that reason, but there are certain things I don't use the petites on. And one of them is a 40 count fabric or higher. We learned a trick from a, a woman that gave us a class um, at our guild. And she suggested that you use a size 10 ballpoint beading needle when you're stitching on something that's 40 count or higher and it's just wonderful. This is even narrower than a 28, the shaft, and the ballpoint on it is like a tapestry needle so it doesn't just penetrate the fabric very quickly. It can move it around and I recommend these for anything higher than 40 count fabric. They're wonderful. They make other types of needles. Again, we showed them uh, in our variety in our video. So go to that video and take a look. Another critical part of stitching is your support for your fabric. I use my hands for my support. I used to use a stand and I used to use a floor stand. My physical condition doesn't allow me to do that anymore. So I have a Patoki stand. It's the one in the corner back here. It has a little heart hanging off of it. And that sits in my lap. 
and it holds an embroidery hoop thickness. So I can use a wooden embroidery hoop by Hard Hardwick, or I can use the plastic size. This will fit it. And I do my silk. I do all of my high count work using a hoop on one of those with the Potoki stand. They also have Q-snaps, which are very popular. This is the smallest version. It's six inches square. These hold your fabric in place. Clamp your fabric right on and they make it nice and tight. If you have slippage, um, one of the things Deb recommends is using a piece of the cupboard liner that's kind of squishy and sort of a plastic consistency. If you put that over your fabric, a small piece and under the clamp, tightens it up a little bit more, keeps it a little more taut. And you can roll it a little bit once you have it in to tighten it up a little bit more. But these are wonderful. They come in different lengths so you can create a different shape from square to rectangular and they have extensions so there's there's really very little limit to the sizes they even make different lengths and uh, of the clamps to go with the different combinations that you might come up with so that's a q-snap another version of a q-snap that i found and this is when i met deb i was looking at one of these this is by R&R &R Craft, it's R&R &R Craft Frames, and it's the principle of a Q-snap, so it uses the plastic PVC, but it sits and it's created to sit on your lap, so I can do a large piece in my lap, or I can do a smaller piece if I rotate it. And they make this in two sizes. I have the large and the small. Um, and I enjoy it thoroughly. In fact, I have a piece I'm working on right now in my other large one. And again, we discussed those in another video about hoops and snaps and stands. So I'm going to give you the list of those videos. All of those that you've seen, plus a few more, were reviewed in video 104, video 48, and video 35. One of the things I, I often hear from stitchers is, oh, I used to love to cross stitch, but then my eyes went bad. I honestly think that's not a complication. I mean, as I got older, I needed more magnification. I had to get bifocals at work. And I can't sit and work on really, really fine fabric without some kind of additional magnification. But there's so many types of magnification and lighting available now that if you really want to try it, you can. And you might find that you might be extremely successful. This was one of the more recent items that we shared in Gadget Corner. It's a lighted magnification system the light shines in two different places, it's adjustable, and then there's five different strengths of magnification that you can clip into it. And it sits on your head like a pair of glasses. That's what these arms are here. And it's wonderful, it doesn't give you a headache. And I can wear it with my glasses. And um, my husband uses it for his model railroading as well. In fact, he had it first. If you watch the video, you'll see the explanation for that. And that'll be in one of the later Gadget Corner videos in the playlist, if you want to look at that. And then we talk about Magna Clips. Magna Clips come in all powers. I'm just going to get a pair out here. I thought I had a pair on the side table, but I didn't. Got it. I 
in my organizer box. So, this is the sleeve. And this is what they look like. What is nice about these is that they clip on your glasses and they sit to the bottom of your lens. So they work much like a bifocal. You can raise them and cover the whole lens, but I like to be able to see the TV out the top of my distance prescription, so I lower mine. And then I could see the TV at the same time I'm stitching, which I probably shouldn't do because I would frog less if I didn't, but I spend a lot of time enjoying my movies and so it works for me. Magna clips are easily found. They sell them in stationary stores now. I got these, my first pair was back in 2004, I think, online. And I found them on a senior site. At the time, I, I wasn't. <laughs> and I was also much more functional, but they came in handy. So those are available, I think, everywhere from Staples, Amazon, your local needlework stores. Um, just do a search on Magna Clips. And to watch a video on lighting and magnification, and we are going to be doing a segment on lighting again in the near future uh, for another lamp that we've been trying. But we've looked at many of them so that you get a chance to see them. We share whatever we find with you. And these two videos, 77 and 93, talk about both those. Someone was new to stitching in general, had never done needlework, and they wanted to know about thread, uh, floss, what was over dyed. They had no concept of the differences, and so I thought I'd just take a quick second. We do have a video on different uh, flosses and fibers, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. I didn't look it up. It was one of the main topics in the video, so you should be able to find it. Um, I'll see if I can't link that down in the description box. But generally people stitch with six strand embroidery floss. And you would use on a basic count of 14 Ada or 28 count linen, probably two strands uh, for coverage. The amount of coverage that you want to see among the different colors that you use or just your own personal preference, it varies from person to person. If you like to see the whole stitch area covered, then you might increase the strands. Stitching over 32, 36, 40, often people use one strand. Again, it's a matter of personal preference, and it may depend on the color and how much coverage you want. But all of those flosses start at a basic cotton six-stranded level, DMC and Anchor being two of the older ones. Now we have a group of over-dyed flosses that are made from basic six-cotton stranding, and they generate threads that the color, the basic colors of that thread change throughout the skein. <clears throat> Excuse me, and those um, run, there's three major companies, Weeks Dye Works, Classic Color Works, and Gentle Art Sampler. Those three dyers all produce a very broad range of colors and different styles, but the basic thread is the same. It's six-stranded cotton. Then they make silk floss, and the number of strands varies, and where it comes from varies. So uh, there are some silk flosses that might sound familiar to you. Thread Gatherers makes silk floss, and Gloriana is another manufacturer that might be something you've heard of. Again, it's a matter of preference. Um, Silks are more costly than cottons. It just depends on the look you want, 
whether it's an heirloom piece, how much time you're putting into it. And sometimes it's just a matter of what did the designer use? What did you like the best? And you go from there. So I did want to just make a note about basic threads. Once you get ready to start stitching and have accumulated a few patterns and some floss and some fabric, you'll probably start accumulating some tools or some little containers of needles, things like that, and you'll want to organize it. There are a couple of things we've talked about, and I'm just going to show you two. This is a Yazi bag. This is a small mini case, and it has a double zipper, so it goes both ways. I haven't seen a lot of the tapestry fabric. They do a lot of black, blue, solid colors. This one was unique. Um, they have a zipper compartment with a view on the cover. Then there's two, three, four four and the back. So there's six total. And they all have a zipper. They all have full compartments inside. I use this for all my different needle packages. Makes it nice. I just have one place to look. And then there's something that we like to use when we go traveling or on a retreat. And I use one also at home for my finishing tools, and that's our handy caddies. This is just a small handy caddy. It's got three pockets on each side. Handy caddy has a website, handycaddy.com, but you can also find them on Hirschner's, Amazon, multiple locations. And again, those two items we've talked about at length before on video 31 and video 35. So you might enjoy visiting those to get some more information. People asked about things that they'd seen on other videos. One of the things that came up recurringly was, what is a laying tool and why do you use it? And I was just mentioning that when you're stitching, oftentimes you use two strands of floss. When you create your stitch, you have two legs to it. First leg goes corner to corner, second leg goes bottom corner, upper corner, opposite direction. That's where you get your X. If you're doing two strands, the broadest coverage and the nicest stitch, those two strands would be laying side by side. Oftentimes when you stitch, your thread twists and then threads become twisted and when you stitch, they might be laying on top of each other when you draw your stitch closed. So, using a laying tool, which is virtually nothing more than a long pointed object. People use everything from shawl pins to large needles to trolleys. All of these things are described as laying tools. anything with a point. And this is actually called a boo-boo stick. Rainbow Gallery now makes them. They used to be made by another company. But if you look, you see that small point. That's just a size 26 needle bent and put in the end of a dowel there. That's all that is. So let's use that as an example. If I were laying my stitch and it is in my needle, I would use this. I would put it against my fabric right where I'm laying my stitch. I would draw my needle and thread down over the top of it. And as it gets to the point of that long needle or tip, the threads spread and then they close this way on the fabric as opposed to this way. And there's another technique called railroading, which we have in our, I believe our how to's and also our general video list. Railroading is a way that as you're laying your stitch, 
you take your needle tip and you place your needle tip between those two threads as you draw it down. And then it spreads over the thread that's going between it as it comes down in and separates the threads that you're laying in that half the stitch. Some people railroad just the top and spread the top too so that they have that nice finished look. Some people are more, I don't know, intense, <laughs> have more specific desire there and they want both legs to be exactly flat. So they railroad both halves of the stitch. And um, it's the same technique, you just do it with both. Again, we have a video on railroading and laying tools. And you can watch more about that on video 20. One of the things I wanted to say before we end our second chat about basics is that we hear from stitchers regularly that uh, they're stitching alone. They don't have anybody else to stitch with. They enjoy watching YouTube videos because it gives them companionship. And we appreciate that. I certainly understand what it's like to be isolated. Uh, we all experienced that uh, to a great degree in the last year and a half. Um, one of the things that we can do now, and I don't know though that many of them are meeting in person, is encourage you to join a guild. A guild by general definition is a group of like-minded people or like, like occupied, people who have the same occupation, people who do the same things as an interest or a hobby. So stitchers get together, basket makers get together, weavers get together. And in this case, there's a guild called the Embroiderers Guild of America, and they have multiple chapters across the United States. You can look them up online and they also have an online chapter set up for people who want to be connected to other stitchers but aren't geographically connected to other stitchers and that's called cyber stitchers and it's a full-fledged ega guild but all of their communication is done online they do i haven't gotten through all the information they've sent me yet i recently joined but they do talk about the get-togethers that they try to organize in general geographic areas of people who are also cyber stitchers. Uh, I don't know if they're actively doing it now, but think about it. Look it up online. Look it up in your area. See what might exist. We talk about the EGA and cyber chapters on video 32. So I encourage you to check that out. Someone asked us what a sampler is, and that's a valid question. It is exactly what it sounds like. It is a sampling of something. You can do a sampler of alphabets and have many different fonts on the piece that you stitch. So you'd have A to Z in one font, A to Z in another font, A to Z in another font. Maybe you'd do it in different colors. All depends on your uh, scheme and your decorating and your interest, but there's a lot of uh, Bristol samplers now. These are coming out of orphanages. They're done in reds. They're just gorgeous. Um, a lot of alphabets in those. And then you have samplers that you scratch your head and you don't see an alphabet on and you wonder what that's about and they call it a sampler. Well, it's a sampling of something that's similar. So I can look at two samplers I have by Nancy Rossi these were back in the 70s and 80s, um, and they have little motifs on them that all tie together to a theme. So one of them is country, so each of the little motifs on this pattern are country motifs. Another one uh, talks about home, and all the motifs on this one um, are about a home, or you might see in someone's home. So sampler is a word that has more than one definition, but it's basic representation is that there are multiple things or samples of something similar all 
demonstrated on that piece of needlework or that design. So, wrapping it up, we are going to mention another video on basics. It'll be a little more detailed, a little less of a discussion. It'll look more at some specialty stitches, things like scissors, other things that we might be able to go a little more in depth. So, thank you for joining us. Hope you had a nice day. I encourage you, as always, to share the joy of needlework. Bye-bye.